Um, and now we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to have um, presentations from, each, some, from some of the working groups uh, focused on um, outcomes related to specific clinical trials. So you can see um, you know, how we use the outcome measures, how even one trial might have more than one kind of outcome measure to see how we as groups work together and collaborate. Um, so first, we're, so we're going to have two short presentations, 10 minutes. Um, one is going to be Andrew Gross on the functional and patient report outcomes that they're using in plexiform neurofibroma trials. And then Dr. Karen Walsh is going to talk about um, the neurocognitive outcomes working group for neurocognitive trials. And then we're going to do breakout sessions about those two, those two types of trials to hear from you all and discuss about outcomes and clinical trial designs and ideas for topics and things like that. Then after those two, we'll do two more and breakouts, and then we'll be done. We thought at this point, we better move people around. They're probably starting to fade. So, so Dr. Gross, if you would like to do the next part on the plexiform neurofibroma trials, and then we'll um, get moving on this new section. So, Hello again. All right. I'm putting on my other hat. Um, so this is actually most of what I do um, working at the NIH with Dr. Wiedemann. Uh, as Pam mentioned, I'm working on the phase two clinical trial of salumetinib, and one of the key parts of that has been looking at functional measures. So this is a slide that will look familiar. You've seen it before, I believe, earlier today. Um, but as you know, plexiform neurofibromas are tumors which are not cancerous, but they are often very problematic. Um, they come from nerves and occur in about 50% of patients, up to 50% of patients with NF1. They can cause lots of problems, including pain and disfigurement. And again, I think you've seen these pictures before. I don't think I need to convince anyone in this room that plexiform neurofibromas can be really problematic for many people. They also grow over time, we know that, and they grow most in young children. So this is one of our patients, um, and you can see when she was 11 months old, you can barely see the plexiform in her left cheek. By the time she was three years old, it's pretty obvious. Um, and you know, our hope would be someday to be able to give a medication to her at 11 months old and prevent it from ever getting to a point where it's visible or interfering with her life. Similarly, we have this young guy who has a large plexiform in his arm that at age three was already pretty significant, but by the time he was five years old and really up until present day, he no longer really has function in that arm and had a lot of pain and discomfort. And so, you know, again, I think we all agree here in this room that plexiforms are a problem that we want to work on. So really excitingly, and again, something that's been talked about before, Dr. Wiedemann and her group um, found that in a phase one clinical trial, salumetinib shrunk the plexiform neurofibromas. It was absolutely something that had never been seen before. So there were 24 patients. And as Dr. Wiedemann talked about earlier today, there was 71% response that 17 of the 24 had tumor shrinkage, which was beyond what we had seen in any other clinical trial. Um, there had been some shrinkage in very small tumors with another drug, imatinib, but really in large tumors, this was the first time we saw shrinkage. And we were super excited. So this is our first patient on the trial. You can see that was his, so the white in the center, this is a cross section of the abdomen. The white in the center is the tumor. And you can almost see, can, can you guys appreciate that even by the cycle five, which is five months into the trial, it seems a little bit smaller. And then by the time you get to the 22 months in, so 22 cycles in, it's about, not quite, but just about half as big as it was when it started. So really exciting. So what does this have to do with functional measures? Well, we had anecdotal clinical benefit, meaning we had a lot of our patients coming back and saying, I feel better. This young lady who, again, was featured in the publication, came back to us and said, I can walk better. I, my pain is better. I feel better. And we went to the FDA and we said, awesome. We have a medication. We think it shrinks these drugs. And they said, great, but you have not shown to us that it actually improves patient outcomes. And, you know, and I, I understand I heard a question about this earlier, the frustration there, but that is a completely reasonable question because we're talking about putting very young kids on a medication for years and years. These medications have side effects and we really need to be able to show that we're providing benefit and not just making the tumors shrink a little bit because we're not making the tumors go away. With most we've seen shrinkage in the 40 to 50% range, but most patients we're seeing in the 20 to 30% range if they're having shrinkage. And we need to be able to show that we're gonna provide benefit if we're gonna expose kids and adults to the risk of these medications. So again, 
FDA approval, they've come back to us and said, we, we want to work with you. We want to work with you to approve this medication and other medications for plexiform neurofibromas, but you have to show us clinical benefit. And that's where functional measures come in. So is everyone here familiar with what a functional measure is? Anyone, raise your hand if anyone's confused, because I've used the term about 10 times now already. Excellent, thank you. Thank you for being brave and raising your hand. I appreciate that. Um, because I think it's a confusing term, right? What does that mean? It's very vague. Um, are you talking about how I function in my daily life, or how I function in my ability to lift my arm? What, what does that mean? And really, a functional measure is just a measure of, an objective way to measure your ability to perform a task, whatever that task is. So we can pick the task. We can say it's your ability to walk a certain distance, and we want to see how that changes over time. Or it's your ability to move your arm and bend in a certain way. Your ability to breathe normally and take um, the normal volume of breath that you would expect for someone your same age or sex or height. Um, all of those things are functional measures. So there's things that we can objectively measure and track over time. Um, what's complicated, as you guys all know, is that because plexiform neurofibromas can be located anywhere in the body, anywhere there's a nerve, we have to really tailor the functional measures to each patient's individual plexiform. So it doesn't make sense to do an airway test on a patient who has a giant plexiform in their leg, right? That doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and so we have to make sure we're, we're tracking that over time. And again, the goal with this is to provide more than anecdotal data. It's to provide moving forward, really useful measures. And this just gives you a sense of all the different types of studies. So this is actually our checklist for the phase two clinical trial of salumetinib. Um, and these are all the different possible measurements that, that any one patient can get, depending on the location of their tumor. Um, the things that are checked off here, the airway, motor, and visible, this is actually just one of our patient's checklists. So this patient, every time they come, gets all of these functional measures. And that's one of the things we have to talk about is the fact that these are not necessarily easy for patients to do. It's a lot of commitment. Our patients often come for a week at a time to NIH when they're coming for their assessments. And you know, that's the, again, the benefit of functional measures is we get this prospective information, but there's also some downsides in that they can be really time, time intensive and labor intensive and can and do have some burden on patients and families. So we wanna make sure we're doing the right measures and we're doing them at the right times to get the best information. So I just wanted to kind of pull out one example. Again, this is from the phase two trial. For what we do for patients who have a motor PN, we call it, meaning a plexiform neurofibroma that could impact motor function. Usually this means it's in the arm, neck, or legs um, that we expect is going to have some impact on their ability to function. We look at strength, that, so I think everyone here has probably had a doctor you know, measure their strength, make a fist, don't let me pull, don't let me pull, that, that um, measurement. We look at range of motion. We look at this groove pegboard test, which I have a picture of here. I think this is a, this is a pointer. Excellent. This groove pegboard test right here, um, which looks at, is a measure of fine motion, fine motor, motor skills, how well you can put the pegs into the grooves, or pegs into the spots. Um, we look at endurance by seeing how far someone can walk in six minutes. And we look at really careful measurements of leg length and discrepancy between that and see if that changes over time. So, one patient that had one of these motor, um, particularly on our, on our trial, that had one of these motor tumors, you can see he's got a tumor in his left arm here um, that's pretty significant. And when he first came to us, he had a lot of limitation in his ability to move his neck and his shoulder. So he really couldn't lift his arm up, he really couldn't move his neck very well, and he was having a lot of pain. When he went on the drug, he responded. We were really happy to see. He had about 27% shrinkage by the time he reached a year on drug. And we were able to show that not only did his pictures, so the disfigurement get a little bit better, which the family actually came and told us that was something they were super happy about. They felt like this was a huge change. Um, to us, we can definitely see a change. I don't know if we would have been saying, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing, but it's definitely visible. But the thing that got us really excited was these functional measures. So if you look at the range of motion, so the neck extension, neck lateral flexion, those are just directions of movement and looking at number of degrees. At baseline, those are really limited. And by the time he got to a year, they're all normal. Same with how much he's able to move his shoulder out and rotate his shoulder around. 
Even more importantly, he was on pain medications twice a day, and he went down to no pain medications by a year. And his pain, which he was reporting as you know, that zero to 10 scale, this is the, one of the patient reported outcomes that we're using that are so important. He was reporting at a three out of 10 when he started, went down to a zero out of 10. And how much the pain interfered with his life also went down. You know, overall, he reported that his quality of life, he and his parent both reported on this global impression of change, another patient reported outcome that we're dovetailing with our functional outcomes seemed much improved. So this is what we want to see. But there are a lot of challenges with it. And one of the reasons RAINS exists is because there are no validated measures in NF1, and so trying to figure out which measures to use. And we are using what was recommended by RAINS for a lot of our um, measurements, for instance, for our, our airway measurements and our um, vision, how we're testing patients' vision and who have orbital plexiforms. But we're still learning. So as you can see here, these are some of our airway testing. Um, I don't know, has anyone here had a pulmonary function test or sleep study? Sleep study, anyone? I have, not fun. Not a good time. <laughs> um, so, and this, this is not one of our patients. This is what you get when you Google child sleep study. But it's adorable. Um, but it, it's, it's one of the most miserable that our patients really dislike getting these. You, get, you come in, you get hooked up with all these wires and stickers, and then you have to spend the night in the hospital and sleep. And you know, while it's something that is a meaningful thing, right? it gives us good information, and we can track it over time, Patients really hate it. And the question is, is it worth doing in that setting? Are we getting enough good information? And that's really where RAINS, where RAINS comes in to help us figure out that balance between, yep, we're getting some information, but are we getting enough good information to, that the benefit of it outweighs the burden of the testing? Um, all right, so kind of just to sum up, because there's no clock here, and I think I'm running a little bit over, I apologize, um, but really, the key point here is that functional measures are going to be essential for any drug approval for plexiforms in the future. We know this, um, and I think as a group, we really are moving forward and embracing this and excited to do so. Varied locations make functional measures complicated because you have to figure out what we're measuring, and that we really absolutely need patient and family input to determine the best functional measures that are both practical and meaningful, and that the overlap between those two is really what we're trying to get at. So, any questions? Oh. Questions in the discussion session. Okay, thank you.